Now on to our second case. Dana's investigation into the murder of 35-year-old Tristan Bodette of Irvine. Uh, You know, Dana, no one really expects that in a place like Malibu, that especially in, you know, this is a state campsite. It's not like you can just like, you know, if you're going to camp there, you have to register, you have to pay all this stuff. One presumes it's a pretty safe place. And this, I recall, having lived here in Southern California, it was shocking. It, it was a shock to the system and our sense of security. Do you, How would you describe it? Well, that was actually the initial hook for me into this story is that I live in, you know, I don't live in Malibu, but I don't live that far from Malibu Creek State Park. I take my own kids there. We had been talking in the months right before Baudet was killed about doing an overnight in that campground. And it just completely stunned me that not only that this happened, but that what came out quickly that after the murder was that there had been a number of shootings, even two in that very campground leading up to it. And the public didn't know. So the idea that that there was a potential cover up there was definitely more to this story than you know it wasn't a it wasn't a domestic violence incident which is what you know you might think of right away most people who um, are crime victims in places like state parks are victims of someone they know but this one seemed completely random although there were some perplexing rumors at first because of the kind of work that Tristan Baudet the the father who was killed he he worked as a polymer chemist and he did have um, a number of publications on vaccine development. So there was right away this kind of wild speculation when nobody knew what was going on that, well, maybe he was the target of, you know, an anti-vaxxer or maybe Big Pharma took him out. And it just, it seemed one of the features of of the killing that was so odd was that it seemed so precise. It was both totally random seeming and also very precise because he was shot basically in the center of his forehead um, with a nine millimeter bullet. So that immediately conjures, oh my gosh, was this, you know, a handgun to the, to the temple uh, or to the center of the forehead? And it turned out, and we can talk about this, that that it was not the type of weapon that was used um, according to the, the law enforcement and the DA, but, um, and also probably in all likelihood, there was no connection at all between the victim and the killer. There's there's certainly no connection between the victim and the alleged killer, who is a, a drifter, Anthony Rauda. So um, I, I'm curious, Dana, you, you talk about um, where he was shot. If you could paint a picture for us of the scene so we can have a better understanding, because he it was, what, nearly three in the morning when this happened? So I want you to picture a beautiful campground in a meadow tucked into the Santa Monica mountains. You're a couple of miles from the beach, from Surfrider Beach, which everyone knows from Gidget and everything else. (laughs) And and then you're in this, you know, beautiful wilderness area that uh, so many TV shows and movies have been filmed in this park. It was a, it was a movie ranch before it was actually a state park. So if you, you know, if you know MASH, that show, Mm -hmm. there's the the MASH camp is there where, um, you know, it's sort of, it, it, doubled for for North Korea. And the, uh, <laughs> it is uh, a beautiful oak meadow nestled in the mountains. And it was full. It was uh, the summer solstice. It was the it was peak summer. You know, there were families in every just about every spot in that campground. Um, and at about 430, 440, 445 in the morning, shots rang out. Did the person who killed Tristan Baudet. Did that person actually enter the tent or was he shot through the tent? And if he was shot through the tent, how in the world did he get such a precise hit? The precision of the hit may have been a fluke. It, uh. it He was shot from outside of the tent. Um, nobody knows if the shooter approached the tent lifted the dew flap, looked inside, then backed up and shot. We don't, nobody saw this. <laughs> there was, there were ear witnesses, but not eyewitnesses in a sense. And so Baudet was in the tent with his two small children. They're two and four. 
the two-year-old couldn't even, at that point, she couldn't really talk even. And the four-year-old was, you know, confused and traumatized. So nobody saw anybody kill Tristan Baudet. People heard these shots. There were a couple of entry holes, a couple of bullets seemed to seem to have entered the tent. There was only one exit hole because the other bullet that entered the tent entered Baudet's head and then was lodged in his shoulder. The, the trajectory of the bullet was very strange, I think, because probably because he was lying down um, at the time. And just, you know, his daughters are nestled right in there with him when this happens. So the shooter escaped without being detected. The woman I talked to just recently called 911 and, you know, in fairly short order, there were police, uh, law enforcement, sheriff's deputies mostly swarming that campground. You know, then the rangers were there and then, the, you know, the paramedics and and Odette was declared dead that morning. Um, this all happened in the dark and whoever did it got away in the dark and knew the park very well is what law enforcement assumed. Now, um, Baudet and his two daughters, they were also with other members of the family and other members of the family were in a separate tent. So I'm, d- does the four-year-old, because now this happened in June, June of 2018, June 22nd of 2018. So my guess is, was there anything that the four-year-old was able to verbalize to authorities? And I'm sure she's still suffering tremendously at this point. I don't know that. Her privacy has been well protected. Um, Baudet's brother-in-law was in the next tent or the next campsite over. They were on a dad's and kids camping trip. So so Scott McCurdy was in a tent with his two little boys who were three and five. And he is the one, Scott is the one who discovered his dear friend and brother-in-law dead because he heard the girls crying and he couldn't figure out why they were still crying and what was going on and why wasn't Tristan helping them. And he he went into, into the tent and he discovered this horrific reality, which is that Tristan had been killed. So Dana, at this point you have a clear murder. I mean, without question, this person was intentionally killed. There's all this speculation that maybe it has something to do with the fact of what he does for a living. And this could have been a targeted hit. It's also, you know, the idyllic location where nothing like this should happen. But as often happens, when something becomes public, people who either know something or remember something start coming forward. And this is, to me, the interesting dynamic here of of how this case had both an investigative component and then the journalism component, because people started coming forward to news organizations and saying, hey, wait a minute, I was shot at. Hey, wait a minute. My car was shot at. And and tell us what that ends up revealing about what authorities did and didn't know. That's where things started to get really, really complicated and really interesting. Because as you said, shortly after Baudet's murder, people started talking about experiences they had had. And it, it, it turned out that starting 20 months before the murder, there had been a series of shootings. Now they didn't all match up and line up perfectly. So it was pretty complicated. The the first victim who's now um, on this list of, um, of charges that, you know, the criminal charges against Anthony Rauda now begin with a, a November, 2016 shooting in Malibu Creek state park, but not in the campground. Somebody, um, a young uh, hiker named Jimmy Rogers was just had just slung a hammock between two trees. He was hiking the Backbone Trail, which is a long and somewhat disjointed trail that goes through the Santa Monica Mountains. And he didn't feel like, you know, making a reservation and paying 50 bucks to (laughs) sleep in the campground. He was was on, you know, a big wilderness expedition. So he was sort of in this area of the park that's really for day use only and picnics. And, and And he woke up at about, you know, somewhere between three and five in the morning. And... He had the memory of hearing a sound, but he couldn't kind of place it. And then he looked at his arm and his jacket was shredded and he was, his arm was stinging and he couldn't figure out, he thought he'd been bit by a rabid animal or he's a wildlife biologist. So he thought maybe it's vampire bats, which actually are a real thing that have (laughs) migrated up from, you know, their, 
typical habitat range. And, uh, but he tried to report it and he just didn't make a lot of headway. I mean, there just didn't seem to be a ton of interest from authorities. He, a few weeks after this happened, he noticed that a little metal pellet started coming out of his arm. And that's when he thought, you know, I, this wasn't a rabid animal or a vampire bat. I've been shot. These are, these are like almost like metal BBs and they were from a shotgun shell. Um, Bird shot comes packed in like a plastic cartridge, lots and lots of little metal balls, and they're designed to scatter so that you can hit birds that are flying. And he, it turned out, had been shot with a shotgun shell. There was that. Then the next two incidents were in the campground, also ammunition that appeared to have been fired from a shotgun. Then you have a shift in location out of the park. And onto the road, the canyon road that goes right by the park. So somebody standing in the park in a hidden location, firing at moving cars on the road, also in that same time period, between three and five in the morning. Okay. All of these, all of these incidents have so they have more or less location in common. They have type of ammunition, more or less, something that could be fired by a shotgun. Most of them were birdshot. One of them was a, a metal slug, but it's also a shotgun shell. Then you have one other feature in common of these first five near misses, a single shot. So there were some people within the Lost Hill Sheriff Station, which is the local sheriff station that has jurisdiction. They share jurisdiction with um, the Rangers and California State Park, but after the third park shooting, someone at the park called over to a buddy at Lost Hill Sheriff Station and said, something weird is going on. There have now been, you know, the guy in the hammock and then two um, two campground shootings. It was just cars were shot. People weren't hit in those instances. But, um, and so therefore, some people within Lost Hill Sheriff Station got interested. Then when the next two shootings happened on the road, it was definitely their jurisdiction. And they were starting to connect these dots but they couldn't really get momentum within, you know, at the higher supervisory levels above them to do a full-blown investigation, bring in major crimes, get all the resources they might need. So they were sort of nursing this theory that I think there's a shooter. I think there's a Canyon shooter. And I always liken it to like, as if, you know, 10 guys in the local sheriff station believed in Bigfoot and everyone else was like, there's no Bigfoot, you know, and they are trying to build this case, but just doing it a little bit on their own time and on their own steam. So then a year passes without another shooting, almost a year, 11 months. And that and I find interesting because like, I, I hear you and I certainly understand, you know, Tristan's widow's position on this it, and, and the brother-in-law who went... If we had known about this, we wouldn't have gone. I totally, totally get that. I think, though, you know, sometimes you can't see things when they're happening individually. You can only see things when you put them out as a big map. And I think that year-long gap, that's a challenge, right? That That's a challenge on the potential conspiracy part of this. You're right. That did. And I think it, I think it also allowed some people to think, okay, let's not make a big deal about this. It stopped. Right. So what's the problem? It stopped. So we had some shootings we can't figure out. Maybe it was, you know, what they call plinking, like someone just kind of shooting for fun and they accidentally hit someone or hit something. Or maybe it's teenagers or, you know, who knows? There were kind of, there just wasn't a high level of concern, except among this small group of detectives who were really focused on their belief that there was a canyon shooter and and their fear that it was going to escalate. So it's several months later when there is an arrest. Um, and, and the person who gets arrest is, again, uh, appears to have been living there, had a criminal, has a criminal record, um, claims that he's a survivalist and was living there. Um, explain to me, if you would, how they captured this person and charged him? So the first thing that happened after Baudet was killed is that the cops were telling everyone the official story from the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department was 
okay, fine. You may have heard about these earlier shootings because that was all coming out. They're not connected. There's no forensic connection. We don't have a connection. This is not part of the same thing. But four days before Bodet was killed was the last near miss, the sixth near miss. And it was another car on the Canyon Road, again, between three and five in the morning. But this time it was the the bullet that was uh, recovered was a nine millimeter bullet, which is the same type of bullet that killed Bodet, which can't be fired from a shotgun. There was a weapon change, but they still were not making any of these connections. None of this was clear, as you're saying. They were telling people, don't worry, don't worry. But, you know, panic was rising in Malibu and people were hearing shots in the night. And there's a there's at the very least, there's a murderer at large <laughs> because Bodette is dead. Correct. And and what is going to happen next? So at the end of the summer, there start to be reports of local like businesses around the periphery of the park being burglarized in the middle of the night. And what is being stolen is not... Uh, you know, the computers, the cell phones, the wallets, that type of stuff. It's food. And so one of these businesses puts up a camera and another one of these businesses has a camera up already. And both of those places capture footage of uh, a man dressed all in black, kind of tactical gear is what they describe, um, with a headlamp and and seemingly a rifle slung over his shoulder. And this person has been breaking in and stealing food. So all of a sudden, they've got an armed burglar in the area who's stealing food. This is weird. These things are kind of don't really match up well. There's a lot of wealth in that area. If you're an armed burglar, aren't you going for safes and you know prescription drugs and you know all that kind of stuff? No, this guy is stealing you know Jimmy Dean breakfast sausages. And so this is automatically like everyone's on high alert already because they know that they've got a murderer at large. And then here's this weapon as a special, it looks to be a special kind of rifle called a carbine, which can fire a nine millimeter round. So this suddenly also raises a concern, like, could this be the killer? Could this be Bodette's killer? What ends up happening is that the last break-in is at the community center that is literally the next door neighbor of the Lost Hill Sheriff Station. And two search and rescue people, Sergeant Tui Wright and one of his uh, man trackers who's trained in you know following trails through the wilderness, go to investigate that burglary. They find broken glass and it's basically like a vending machine has been smashed open with a rock and food, the snacks have been taken out of the vending machine. Um, they follow with a dog, they follow that scent and they, and they also see a boot print that matches the odd, um, shape and style of a boot print that had been seen at another business that had been burglarized. One of the ones that had put up a camera after some incidents and they follow it up into the hills behind the sheriff station. Sun goes down. They have to stop the search. The next day they're able to get a larger team out there and they capture the drifter at his camp. His name is Anthony Rauda. He's got the carbine on him. He's got nine millimeter ammo on him. And um, they bring him in on prob- weapons and probation violation charges because he does have this criminal history. He's not supposed to have weapons or ammunition. And after um, the, after uh, basically after he's sentenced for his, his probation and weapons violations, He's then charged with the murder of Bodet and a slew of other attempted murders and the armed burglaries. So by this time, a lot of people in Malibu have completely lost trust in law enforcement because they feel they were lied to, that the shootings weren't connected. They feel that there was a law enforcement cover-up. They don't know why nobody ever warned or put out any information in the park or from law enforcement. Um, about the presence of a shooter there, which, you know, if there was a rapist in the area, they probably would have put that on the local news. Um, If there were mountain lion attacks in California State Park, they would have posted. But there was a known, you know, there was, well, I should say there were known shootings Mm -hmm. and nobody was warned. So, so a lot of people started to say, oh, isn't that convenient? You just picked up the drifter who lived behind the station. In the court appearances that he's had, 
he has certainly manifested a lot of aggression and he's had to wear um like a, like a beekeeper's hood if you will because he keeps trying to bite and spit at people but i got to tell you he's doing himself no favors with the way he is acting um and i know that you have developed some communications with him which is what i'm really curious about because there's there are the images which i see uh, from court that frighten me and make me think, you know, yeah, he does look like a guy who's been living in the woods for years. Um, but you have a different perspective. Well, he's definitely a guy who's been living in the woods for years. Yes. But he, you know, we have to say just loud and clear, he says he's not guilty. So Absolutely. Um, no, no conclusions beyond just speculation can be drawn, but... What my experience, so I started corresponding with him. Uh, you know, he's been in custody since October of 2018. Um, and I started corresponding with him soon after that. And, you know, I've actually have been working on this for almost three years. So there have been a lot of twists and turns in, in that dynamic. But um, he's a really intelligent guy. Um, you can tell from his letters, he's not... Um, He's sort of self-taught. He dropped out of high school, I think, in his senior year and did get a GED, uh, did basic training, infantry training in the Army, left after a couple of months, um, lived a life of, you, you know, came back out to California where he was born. He was born in LA, he had spent some of his uh, adolescence in Florida, and then came back out to California, reconnected with his father, and really just seemingly couldn't get along in normal society, just didn't feel at ease, didn't form relationships easily, didn't, you know, didn't have friends or a girlfriend or, you know, couldn't even, he lived periodically on and off with his father and, um, and his father has a, a second family. And really he was, even when living in that household, he really only could comfortably communicate with his dad is what I've learned from the family that he just was, you know, you could say shy, you could say reserved, you could speculate that there was something else going on. Rauta himself um, has said that he has PTSD and other forms of trauma from abuse at the hands of law enforcement. And this goes to the heart of uh one of my theories about what may have happened is that he had this long-standing grudge against the Lost Hill Sheriff's Department because he had been in and around that area for decades. And as a homeless person in that area, he'd come into contact with law enforcement quite a bit. He'd also had DUI and was arrested by Lost Hills. I think he has had lifelong struggles with uh, maybe self-medicating. Um, but he hated these cops and it's no accident. It puzzled me for so long. Why is he camping right behind the station? What if he's trying not to be, you know, it is a pretty wilderness type of area. So he might never have been found. Why do you, why do you burglarize the place next door to the sheriff's station? What's this game? And it just, it feels to me like a cat and mouse, like trying to draw these, these cops who he does not like into his terrain where he's comfortable, maybe create some kind of a shootout situation. You know, who knows? This is so all do you do you think that these outbursts in in court where he has to be restrained? I mean, it's you know, he literally has to be restrained to the chair uh, and sometimes at the same time, you know, um with the protective gear to pr protect everybody else. He has fired his public defenders. He, his last outburst was because he's mad at the judge because he wants to defend himself. He's charged with murder, which is very serious. And if you have someone who may not be able to competently defend themselves, you know, what is the greater good? Do you give that per person, right, the benefit of the doubt, innocent until proven guilty, assist them with their defense? Um, I'm trying to figure out, you know, you're, you're painting one picture and I'm seeing another. And they could both be him. Well, I do think that there is a huge disconnect. Um, I I don't think that there are separate pictures. I mean, I am saying that he, from my point of view, he's somebody who 
can be coherent and he can be incoherent. That's a feature of mental illness. Yeah. And he's somebody who has struggled with authority ever since, maybe since he left the army, maybe before, I'm not sure. But certainly his track record with problems with law enforcement in the area where the crimes that he is now uh, charged with took place, those go back to 2003. So, or even earlier, 2001. So we're talking about, you know, 15, 20 year history of tangling with these same law enforcement entities. And he's enraged and then he goes to jail and then he says he gets beat up in jail. And then he says, you know, and then he goes to prison and he's in and out of prison. And his mental health situation has only been aggravated by the ways in which he's contacted the system. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't let him off the hook for anything he may have done. It's just a perspective on it, which is yeah. to say, you know, right now, yes, you, his the criminal case is suspended while his mental his mental health and his ability to stand trial is evaluated. And the last time I was in court a couple of weeks ago, he seemed calm, cogent, and respectful. And the judge who kind of gotten sick of him. She's a really patient woman, but she's gotten pretty sick of him. Um, she even allowed him to speak. Usually what she's been saying lately is like, I'm not, I see you're waving your hand. I'm not acknowledging you because <laughs> though his hand is strapped down. He can kind of wave it. Right. I'm not going to acknowledge you. You may look speak through your lawyer. This time I think she could tell he was in a better place and he had some requests that were, you know, he just had some words to add that were not combative and they were kind of interesting and insightful. You know, he had the, the medical intervention had been taking place over the previous couple of months. So what I think I saw is someone who was brought back to a baseline mental wellness okay. through whatever interventions had been undertaken. And you think, okay, is this as simple as when he's out in the wilderness, he's not getting medication and he's not talking to psychiatrists and he's got some real problems and then they manifest as this kind of anger, shooting things. Maybe he's, he says he's written to me in letters that he's blacked out at times and doesn't know what he's done. So is you can kind of paint a picture where it starts to become possible that this person who his family describes as shy and quiet and scared of people who would never do anything like this could become Anthony Rauta the killer. It, it starts... To so that's sense. the question. So, so of course, the most serious charge here is the murder charge. And the question that you've been asking, and I'm not sure, obviously, that you can answer it, but you certainly have been raising the question, Do does it appear that authorities have the right person in custody? So what I can say is that a grand jury was convened. Um, resulting in an indictment after the criminal charges were filed there uh, about six months later, grand jury is convened. Eventually those grant that grand jury testimony gets unsealed and I'm able to see it. And it says that the sheriff's department weapons expert has declared that there's a match between the rifle, the carbine that Rauta was arrested with, and the nine millimeter bullet that was excavated from Tristan Baudet's body. So grand jury testimony is very significant, very powerful, but it is not subjected to cross-examination by a defense attorney. So the defense attorney may be able to poke all kinds of holes in that. But for me, that is a significant um, shift in the direction of well, he had the weapon that a, a, a sheriff's department employee is going to testify was the is the murder weapon, and that's pretty tight. Here's what's not tight: they didn't, they never found the so-called shotgun for the first five near misses, the ones that used shotgun ammunition. He's still charged with all of those attempt as attempted murders. No shotgun was ever found. The DA supposes that it that Anthony Rauta built a weapon, a DIY type of weapon, like a, a homemade ghost gun, a zip gun. Mm -hmm. um, but that zip gun has also never been found. So this, you know, the, the evidence linking him 
to those earlier shootings is more tenuous because they don't have the murder weapon. They have some pipes and some nails that they found at the camp. They have the shells, the, some shotgun shells that look like they were not fired from a manufactured weapon, that look as if they were fired from a from a zip gun, but they do not have an assembled functional zip gun with all of the elements and ingredients that would be needed for that. So, Okay, so that's very strong, incriminating evidence, all of which to be determined at trial, and this is going to trial, and he has mm -hmm. said repeatedly that he is not guilty, that he did not do this. He did not kill Tristan Baudet. This area of California, obviously, it falls victim a lot to massive wildfires. And after his arrest, not too long after that, we had a very destructive fire go through the area. Do you believe that really any potentially significant evidence could have been lost in that fire? Yes. <laughs> and if people listen to the podcast, um, which I hope they will, this, you know, I, I don't want to spoil it too much, but no. Anthony Rauta's campsite where he was, um, you know, he had sort of had a dugout with a tarp over it in the hills behind the sheriff's station. So sort of, you know, extra remote and rarely traveled part of Malibu Creek State Park. The fire went right through there. I went there after the fire, after a lot of regrowth. And, you know, the, the tree trunks are black. The, you know, the grass was beautiful and bright green because that's what happens after a fire, after the rain. And then there's, you know, the new growth is, is significant. But he was, had been in a place that was um, really decimated by the fire. And the campground too was uh, the fire ripped through there. It wasn't it wasn't completely um, devastating there, but you know the fire also revealed evidence, which I think is pretty interesting. After the fire, it was possible for the search and rescue team to go back to where they suspected he'd been shooting at, at cars on the road from, and find um, nine millimeter casings that might have been part of the shooting at the, the car that was four days before Baudet's killing. So the fire took away evidence and it revealed evidence and it's all pretty complicated. But one thing I can say is that I was supposed to go out to Rauta's camp. I met somebody who right after Rauta was arrested, who said, oh, I know where the camp is. And I said, amazing. Can, like, can you take, can you show me where it is? And too hard to find on my own. And he said, sure, sure. And he went and he did a little scouting mission because we were going to meet up and he took a bunch of pictures. And then the fire came through. So we said, oh my God, we can't, you know, it was mayhem in Malibu. I mean, you couldn't, the Malibu Canyon Road, which is, you couldn't even drive up there. Um, so months passed and um, I'm looking through the pictures and I know they were taken right before the fire. So I know that whatever's in these pictures is probably gone now. And I see something. And it looks to me, not an expert, but now I've looked at a lot of images of zip guns and a lot of, uh, a lot of the manuals that Rauta himself owned and um, electronic files he had. I was able to find out a lot of what his reading material and his sort of personal library and his personal exposure to plans and diagrams for making zip guns. And he was very interested in zip guns. I saw this piece of wood that had clearly in this photograph been manipulated, was not, it was a manufactured piece of wood, like a two by four that had cuts out of it that clearly suggested that it could be part of a zip gun. That was not collected by law enforcement. This guy had gone through there when law enforcement was done and the next day the fire came through and it was made of wood and there's almost no chance that that thing is still intact. And all that exists is a picture of what could have been potentially really important evidence. But for me, what this is evidence of is, did, did, what were the homicide detectives looking for or doing? They knew they were looking for a zip gun. They knew they didn't have a zip gun. This thing looks exactly like a zip gun frame. So it was to me more revealing about 
the potential lapses in law enforcement's approach to the case than it was. It can never be used definitively in Anthony Rauta's case because it's just a picture. There's Mm -hmm. no, you know, it can't be recovered. So this is still, it has not gotten to trial yet. We're still, has, does he even have an attorney yet? Have they figured that out? Well, he does now, you know, he's moved through all the public defenders and, and, uh, and he's, he's, you know, he'll still, I'm sure he'll still ask to represent himself every time he has a chance to speak. But um, it is now, uh, he now has a lawyer who is a, a, a private criminal defense attorney who is on the list that, um, that basically the court has for uh, representing indigent people who have gone through all the possible public defenders. So it's another way that uh, of having basically a, a free lawyer. So okay. So there will be a trial at some point. It's just a matter of getting through all of this. Well, there might not be because if he right now where things are, there should be. But mm-hmm. the, the the DA is quite confident that the, the prosecutor is quite confident that there will be a trial. What is happening right now is that the his mental health had to be evaluated and his ability to stand trial. And one psychiatrist's report conflicted with the other psychiatrist report. Both the prosecution and the defense get to have an evaluation and they were in conflict. Now, I don't know, but I'm just going to hazard a guess that probably the prosecution psychiatrist said he'd be fine to stand trial. I'm going to guess you're right. Said he wouldn't be. Um, So they had to bring in a third person from the, again, from the court list. And so that has been happening over the past couple of weeks. And I will be in court on Monday and we will, it'll be the tiebreaker. We'll find out on Monday whether he's going on trial or not. Do you know the Appalachian uh, killer case? It's just very, very similar. The Appalachian trail killer. He just a couple of weeks ago, um, he, he basically was declared not competent to stand trial, but he, and he's going to um, spend, you know, probably the rest of his life in an institution. And, and he's somebody who was brought back to, a level of coherence that, you know, you think if only these interventions could happen before yes. people killed yes. people. Of course, um, no, that, they, that is they can a huge do it. problem. They can do it. They can get, they, you know, the, the, the medicine is good and you can get people, a lot of people can be brought to a, a baseline well-being and, and kind of, um, it's just so unfortunate that it takes being on, trial for murder to um, actually get those resources applied. But so where it is right now is I'm guessing the trial will start. I'm thinking it may start this summer. There is, there is a possibility that on Monday I find out that it was two to one and he's going to an institution, not going to be on trial. So we'll follow that as well. We also want to mention that uh, Tristan's widow, Erica Wu, um, who is raising these two children who are at that crime scene, she is suing L.A. County and the Parks Department for $90 million for not warning about the other shootings, which then would have given her family more information to make an informed decision and maybe not go to the campsite at that time. So that's also working its way uh, through the legal system, which I always say sometimes it's in the civil court that a lot is revealed. It may not rise to the level of a criminal case but reveals a lot of information about what was really going on at the time. So that's something else to follow. Thank you, Dana, so much for this. It's it's uh, the deep dive that you've provided us and your observations and the, the details are, I mean, this, this is the kind of stuff that we live for, and it's a fascinating case. Thank you so much.